Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There you go, right down there. If you wanna be among the first to hear my weekly takes, NFL, college football, more, right there. All right, a day later, but never a dollar short. John Middlecoff, former NFL scout. We do our uh, 50 minutes to an hour, chop it up. And even though this is the NFL's off season, there's all sorts of news going on. DraftKings released its NFL win totals. There's a couple of weird ones. Uh, God, did Kirk Cousins get respect? The Falcons are 10 and a half. That is ultimately Vegas and DraftKings telling you Kirk Cousins is a very good, capable quarterback in this league. 10 and a half, by the way is the same number for Josh Allen in the Bills and Joe Burrow in the Bengals and Tua and Mike McDaniels. <laughs> so I think it's funny. There's just, there's certain people in every industry that are way more respected than the public understands. John Middlecoff, the former NFL scout, three and out. That of all the DraftKings unders and overs, Falcons 10 and a half was like, holy crap. And most, I mean, they do have a good old line for Kirk, but I think Kirk Cousins is way more respected in the league than he is outside of the league. Well, think about it. The previous year, right? They won 13 games. They were in the playoffs. They started slow this year, but they were coming on. He was playing his best football. That They would have been a clear factor to make a wild card. I mean, he's proven. I mean, if he's healthy and the team's solid, he's a playoff. Might not win in the playoffs, but he can get you there, which, let's face it, 90% of owners would sign up for in a heartbeat just to be – you know, playing football in the middle of January. I think people, you know, obviously you want to win the Super Bowl. All these teams just want to make the playoffs. Right. In football, a lot like March Madness, it's not a seven-game scenario. The Giants were not as good as Minnesota two years ago, but they beat them. And they played in the second round, and then they got their break speed off by the Eagles. You just got to get to the dance. And then we saw the Giants win two Super Bowls as, as wildcard teams. They, they, they went on the road. Football is kind of unique that yeah. way. And also... To give you a double shot of Kirk Cousins' value, the Vikings, despite a loaded offensive roster, uh, I think what's considered one of the sharper offensive coaches, the Vikings are only a six and a half win team. Well, that's Kirk Cousins. And we both like Sam Darnold athletically, but they're they're telling you there's a gap of like three to four games between Kirk Cousins and Sam Darnold. So if you just look at the over-unders on the Falcons, 10 and a half, Vikings, six and a half. And we know the coach with Minnesota in an offensive pivoting league is a really effective coach. Won a game without a practice with Josh Dobbs. The Vikings are one of the more talented teams in the league offensively, six and a half wins. So that that doubles down on Cousins is viewed inside analytics, Vegas, DraftKings, the league, much higher value than everybody outside of the league. Well, of, of all the guys, right, not making huge money or a young player who's going to ascend to make a lot of money like a C.J. Stroud, Sam Darnold either is going to set himself up to be a starting quarterback for the foreseeable future if he has a good year and he's successful, or he's just going to be a lifetime backup. I mean, that's because he's going to get judged. I mean, even if they end up drafting J.J. McCarthy, he's going to start. It'd be hard for that guy to beat him out come week one. Uh, but if he plays well, and there are definitely people to play well with, right, at wide receiver. But if it does not go well, like his his days yeah. of ever being discussed anymore, and I'm I'd be done holding on as well. Not that I have much stock, but I haven't That's sold right. it all. I feel the same way. So J-Mac on our show today that heard FS1 brought up a really interesting point. He's very good at this because he's got a lot of contacts with agents and stuff. So here's Jim Harbaugh just continually saying, J.J. McCarthy's the best player in the draft. I mean, this guy's unbelievable. <laughs> well, as he brought up today, Minnesota is poised to move up. Every rumor on every board is Minnesota's moving up. They've accumulated two first picks. Well, they don't want to move up to first, second, or third, probably, because then you'd have to give up multiple ones, you know, for a college player. Um, but you could move up to five with the Chargers and probably get J.J. McCarthy because we we don't believe, unless the Giants move up spots to go to Arizona spot, it really is very, nobody, Chicago's not giving up their pick. I don't think Washington's given up their pick. Now, New England's open for business at three. But I, I think there's some misgivings with Jaden Daniels' size, uh, some of his style of play, to put him up in New England in that weather. My guess is, it, so J-Mac said what they're doing basically is Harbaugh saying how great McCarthy is. Because if you like J.J. McCarthy, he'd be a reach at one, two, or three. But at five, if he is a reach, 
it's not a huge reach if he's projected to be 9, 10, 11, 12. And all Harbaugh is doing is saying, oh, this guy's great. He wants you to spend more to get his fifth pick. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly what he's doing, right? Well, Adam Peters told the local guys today they're not open for business. They've listened, but they that's were never Washington's open for business. GM. That's Washington's GM. I, I, I do think the Patriots saying that, here's the problem for the Chargers. Ideally, they would love to do that deal, right? 11, 23, maybe next year's two. Big haul, kind of help reset their roster. Monty Austin Fort, the Arizona Cardinals GM, said, we have flashing lights open for business, right? Flashing lights. Gerard Mayo said within the last 24 hours, we're open for business too. If if teams trade up before the Chargers, it takes two to tango. Teams often say, hey, we wanted to move back or we wanted to move forward. We, we couldn't get a yes on the other end of the line. What if quarterbacks and teams trade, either the Patriots take a guy or trade back, and the Giants and the Vikings take three and four? What happens to the Chargers if they get stuck there? Because I, I have a hard time, Colin, envisioning them, and I know these wide receivers are viewed very highly, and I know they just got rid of two. Google Jim Harbaugh's history, and his GM just came from the Ravens. They, they would much more be inclined to take a lineman. Yeah. That's more yeah. their style high in the draft. But they already have a left tackle. Googling alt, he's only played on the left yeah. side. I think it's a little rich for the Oregon State guy who's more of a, a right tackle potentially. Yeah. They already have two defensive linemen, but you could always take a defensive lineman. I don't think there's a guy viewed as a number five overall pick in this draft at that spot. They could get stuck pretty quickly. Now, they could just take a wide receiver. Do you envision a Ravens GM and Jim Harbaugh taking a wide no. receiver with a fifth but, overall pick? I, I can't. So I, can't. I, I have envisioned if they got, if the Chargers got Minnesota's picks and it was two firsts, my first thing I envisioned would be they move back to like, what is it, 11 or 12? What are the Vikings, 11? It's 11. My yeah. takeaway is that they would take the Oregon State tackle at 11, maybe a bit high, but he's a bruiser. And they could also use him on the interior if there are issues. And then I think their second pick would be a defensive tackle from like Texas or one of the big interior linemen. Right tackle, defensive tackle. And I'm like, that's exactly the how. And then they'd go get a center. They got two fourth round picks. They're going to get a center of the third or the fourth round. That's what that's what Jim wants to do. He wants to get big. You know, George Young, the legendary Giants GM, used to always say, when in doubt, go big. That hard, that's how Harbaugh yeah. and Baltimore and the Harbaugh's draft. They just go big a lot. Hell, I can make an argument. Zay Flowers is the first home run wide receiver hit that Lamar Jackson's had. Where you're, I mean, Odell didn't make any impact. Mark Andrews has been really the star of the receiving game. So, yeah, I, I'm with you. And, and they took him in the 20s. Yes. Right, the, the Ravens, the Haloti Nadas, those types, they take higher. Ronnie Stanley, Zay Flowers, are they, are they taking, even though Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze are viewed as top 10, Marvin Harrison, I, I just, I have a really hard time. Now, maybe Marvin Harrison, he's seen him up close and personal. Maybe he feels very comfortable with that player, but I can't imagine that's what they want to do. But I can already envision them getting stuck because if, if a quarterback goes one, two, three, four, whether that's trade ups, obviously Arizona would have to trade back, but let's say the Patriots even stay there. What if there's no one to trade with the Chargers? Well, yeah, you know, I, I so today the New York Giants, the Mara family said um that they can draft a quarterback at number six. The Maras said they're they're they will allow the GM and the coach if they think it's necessary. Nice, of, nice them. of them to say you can draft a quarterback. <laughs> so I th I think they will. I could see the Giants actually. Um, you know, my guess, I don't know if I do Jaden Daniels in that weather. I, I would much rather have. So it, I th don't we both agree it's going to go Caleb Drake May 1 and 2? Do we agree with that? Pelissaro said today from the league meetings that he's heard a lot of J.J. McCarthy with Adam Peters. And when you think of Adam Peters – History, right? Even recently, they won a lot with Jimmy Garoppolo, and then they had immediate success with Brock Purdy. Now, obviously, these two guys are two of the best. I mean, Brady's the best player ever, and Peyton Manning's a top five quarterback. He was around those guys in Denver and then New England. So prototypical, and the one guy that he completely whiffed on with the group was Trey Lance. So I wonder if they're more inclined. I I heard Drake May forever, but then when I saw that, I don't, I don't think that's just getting thrown around because if J.J. could go four, what the hell's the difference of taking him two? If people like him at four or five, it's not crazy to think someone would like him at two, right? It's the same pick, essentially. So tell, 
You either think the guy's a starting quarterback at a high level or right. not. Here's you as a former NFL scout with the Eagles. Take me inside. So I, I got into this thing today. I said Denver's in a weird spot. So are the Raiders. Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell can't be the future in that division. All right. But what if you have Bo Nix at, let's say, 24? Your scouts say, we think he's the 24 the best player. Do I take him? Now, it's quarterback, and I do believe I'm willing to reach at pass rusher or quarterback. Receiver, I won't because there's a glut of talent. There's not a glut of receiver or quarterback talent annually in this league. Max Crosby, fifth round, is a complete outlier. Brady in the sixth round, outlier. Yeah. So what do you do if your scouting department says, listen, we we have him like 24, 25, and we've got the 11th or the 12th pick of Denver on the Raiders, and 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 – I mean, what do you do? What What's the discussion in the draft room? I saw a quote today from Joe Shane, the, the Giants GM, and he said what makes it very unique at the quarterback position, and Chris Ballard talked about this forever, right? Everyone always wanted me to take a quarterback. Well, if I don't like the guy at pick 18 or 15 or 20, just because he's quote-unquote falling, it's not a defensive lineman or a wide receiver or a defensive back that I can mix in. He can just ultimately become my nickel corner. Or, you know, he didn't turn out to be a tackle, but he can be my guard. Or he can be my run-stuffing defensive tackle. Even if it clearly was the wrong pick, he can still... Quarterback's bad, he's <laughs> awful. And he just doesn't right. play. So I, I think it gets very yes. tricky about just because a guy, quote-unquote, is falling. Guys that falling and then are picked, it's because that when Aaron Rodgers fell to the Packers, they liked him a lot. Same with Jordan Love, right? He felt other teams didn't like him, but they valued him and they took him. So I think if a quarterback is, quote, you know, if Bo Nick's there in the mid-teens, you either like the player or you don't at that value. And if you don't, you, you know, if you're unsure, I would never pick the quarterback because that's where you get in these positions where you're kind of stuck, where even these other, the Chargers wide receiver last year was a disaster. What you don't, it's like, well, we, maybe we figure something out. Maybe he becomes our third wide receiver. Maybe there are a couple things he that's can right. do well for. At quarterback, he either can play right. or he can't. And that's why J.J. McCarthy, I, I looked at some of their athletic testing numbers. Alex Smith was taller. I think there are a lot of similarities with Alex Smith. And once Alex got real coaching, Andy and Harbaugh, he was a really solid court. Never Josh Allen or Mahomes, but he was damn good you could make the playoffs with. And I think, and just because a guy has a high physical ceiling, Jaden Daniels, there's no guarantee. So you have to like the guy, and then you have to be able to, everyone puts the comps always like, this guy's the next Patrick Mahomes. I've been watching football for 30 years. I've seen one Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> remember remember when Draymond was drafted for uh, five straight years? Like, this guy's going to be the next Draymond. There hasn't been a Draymond <laughs> since. But no one ever wants the comp. Like, you know what? This guy might be Alex Smith. <laughs> because everyone always wants the guy to be a higher in, in the sure. first round. You can do that with mid-round picks. But no one ever comps. Like, yeah, I think this guy's a third wide receiver. Well, we're taking the guy at 20. Like, that's a problem. So I, I think you got to be very careful with quarterbacks high in the draft. That's why I think teams get very comfortable when a guy falls to the second. You've seen a lot of success stories. Matt Schaub, Derek Carr, Jimmy Garoppolo. There's a lot less pressure. You don't have to play him right away. Let's face it. In modern day football, if I draft a guy, Raiders, Denver, in the top 15, no one wants to see Gardner Minshew or whoever, the Denver, Jared Stidham for long. Might give me a game or two, but just throw the other guy in. And that sometimes can just get yourself in a massive, massive problem. That's why J.J. McCarthy makes sense for Minnesota. They don't have to throw him in right away. Lamar Jackson, back in the day with uh, with the Ravens, they had Flacco, right? So he didn't he didn't start till the middle of the season, kind of got to ease in. Even Brock Purdy, and he was a seventh-round pick, but he wasn't forced into action right away. Some of these guys get forced into action. I don't care who you are. As a young person, your confidence is very, very brittle. I mean, you saw Bryce Young. He, he has another year like that. It could just ruin his right. career. We've seen it happen. What Alex Smith overcame with Nolan and Singletary is one of the greatest accomplishments I've ever seen. Most guys, it just ends them, right? But he didn't break, and then Harbaugh kind of resurrected him. So I, I think that you have to be a realistic with your expectations at quarterback. But no, it's it's very black or white. There's no like, well, we can mix this guy in 25 snaps, and that's where I think you get into a lot of problems. With yeah, I mean, if you whiff with a quarterback at the 12 spot, you're just you just wasted. A pick. I mean, it's one thing if you trade a first round pick like the Rams had done for years to get, you know, Jalen Ramsey and good players. It's another one you don't have it because you whiffed on a quarterback. It's just hard to overcome. 
All right, the NBA season is in full swing. Coming down the stretch, then we move right into the playoffs in April, May, and June. I can't wait. Spice things up with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA right now. All you have to do is put down five bucks and get $150 instantly in bonus bets. Pretty good trade-off. I pay five, I get $150. North Carolina listeners, do not forget, Welcome to the party. DraftKings Sportsbook now live in your state, North Carolina. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Takes 90 seconds. The code is Colin, C-O-L-I-N. Again, 90 seconds. Download DraftKings Sportsbook app. Put in Colin. New customers bet five. Get 150 back in bonus bets instantly. That is the trade. All right. The code is always Colin. The crown is yours. The Deion Sanders thing is interesting. Like, Listen, Colorado football has been irrelevant outside of the Bill McCartney days most of my life. There was the Eric Bieniemy. There was that four or five year run when they just got a lot of LA kids and they were fun. And it, they were, it was really, really uh, a really interesting program for about five years. And so when Dion got the job, you know, my take is he'll make them interesting and he'll recruit. But I wonder if he's doing a disservice to his son. So he, he he's talked about this whole, my son doesn't want to play in cold weather. Well, shit, in January, take out Miami and domes. <laughs> you know, 27 of the 32 teams are cold. Like, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's more, you know, Detroit, thankfully, is in a dome in Minneapolis. Minnesota's in a dome. But there's just a lot of cold weather football. I mean, the Chiefs, the Bills, the Ravens, the Patriots, uh, the Seahawks for a while. The Niners can be very cold in January, December. They've dominated most of the last 25 years of NFL football, 27 years. Pittsburgh. Um, I think Shadur Sanders is really interesting. I wouldn't take him over Caleb or Drake May, but I do think there's an argument I could take him over Jaden Daniels. Um, When his dad says there may be an Eli Manning situation, boy, my takeaway is Elway was probably the greatest quarterback prospect ever. That's why he's even referenced today. Eli Manning's brother, Peyton, won the MVP the year he's coming out. So there's a, oh, oh, here we go. Peyton now is the best young quarterback. Let's get his brother. There was a lot of leverage. Does Shadur Sanders, even with Deion as a dad, have any leverage to do that? Well, I, I think both those guys said it when they were established as the number one pick going into the draft. You know, this guy still has another year of college where, let's face it, anyone that watched the second half of Colorado they, football, it was a fucking disaster. His last four it games, was, he had six touchdowns. He, he was not very good. Now, his first couple games were pretty remarkable. It fell off a cliff. Obviously, it, it doesn't take, you know, an NFL scout to watch his physical talents, right? He can run. He's got a big arm. But by no means, if you just pulled NFL GMs that watched him on tape, would they say he's some lock top pick? Dion's one of the greatest prospects of all time as well. And he, you know, he was in one of the great drafts with like Barry Sanders and Jim Kelly. May I forget exactly. No, that was way before him. But whoever his draft was, was incredible in the Derek Thomas. And, and I remember Dion had a famous story about someone wanted him to take a cognitive test. And he asked him what pick you're taking. It was like the Giants. and They were ninth. He's like, hey, I'm not going to be there. I mean, Dion had a lot of leverage because he was an all time great prospect. Let's just let us see how these guys, we don't even know what position Travis Hunter is going to play. Is he a DB or a wide receiver, right? I mean, he eventually has to establish a position to play in the NFL. He's not going to go both ways. So to put this pressure, and I understand he's like a father. He basically is a father to Travis as well. I have no problem having confidence. Like these guys are going to be great NFL players. He's going to have a big season. But to make that statement already, let's face it, kind of puts a bad taste into everyone's mouth coming in there. Because like you said, one, you end up, whether you're playing in L.A., San Francisco, or Green Bay, you end up playing cold weather games all the time, right? With cross rivals, even teams in your own division end up being cold. The playoffs turn cold on the road. He plays in Colorado right now. It's not warm. Yeah. What's the weather right now in Denver? <laughs> Probably like 35, 40 degrees. So I, I I understand that. You know, he's a Texas, Florida guy. But I, I one, we just had, this guy's not Caleb Williams or Trevor Lawrence. Like, not everyone's universally agreeing that he's some elite player. LA Luck, Trevor, and Caleb going into the season were a unanimous MVP. Shadur isn't. I think people forget this. If you take Jordan Addison out of the equation, SC, Pittsburgh to SC to the Vikings, the last two years without an elite offensive teammate, 
he had 93 touchdowns, Caleb Williams, and 10 picks. Those are and and this year was the best the Pac-12's been in my adult life. I mean, it was really as good. I mean, Arizona was good. I mean, Oregon, yeah. Washington, it, it was excellent. Washington State was solid. Cal was frisky. Yeah. So it's like, guys, come on, what are we what are we talking about here? Utah's always good. So I, I like, I can like Shadur Sanders. I don't think he's close to the power thrower of Caleb Williams. Um, I mean, and and both had bad offensive lines this year. Look at the numbers. I mean, down the stretch, Shadur, and I liked him against TCU. The more I saw of Shadur, the less I liked him. That's probably what I yeah, I mean, I, I think if you had to go off today, Travis Hunter is a better prospect than Shador Sanders. Now, obviously, that can change, and he plays the most important position. But there are going to be a lot of – I mean, there were a lot of eyeballs on him, at least early, once they started being terrible people, you know, fell off. But I, I think this year – and it's going to be fascinating. Let's face it, he plays in a crappy conference. I mean, I would imagine the Big 12 of now the four, the Big 10 and the SEC, I would say the ACC is going to be viewed as better than the Big 12 going into the season. So he – you know, when it all said and done, what if he's kind of playing nobodies and he's not that great again? I mean, are we talking about some for sure top 10 pick? I'm not saying that he can't, he could be the number one pick, but he also could be a second round right. pick. I mean, there's, there's just no, I, I would not put the rubber stamp right now. He is some lock top 10 pick. That's just not the way it works. And things change. Think how often JJ McCarthy wasn't viewed as a top 10 pick coming into the season. Hell, even after the season, I don't think universally the average person would be like, that's a top 10 pick. Now he's going to go like top yeah. five. Jaden Daniels kind of had the Joe Burrow ascension. No one was talking about that guy. Wins the Heisman. Now he's talked about his Bo Nix. I mean, think things change very rapidly in football with the prospects at the quarterback position. So if, if they're going to talk a big game, which Dion does, because Dion can back it up, <laughs> I think sometimes he talks for his kids. And, you know, last year, that Colorado State situation, talking before the game, before, what happened? Was well, best player got destroyed, ruptured a kidney, and like almost died on the field. So Dion's coach now, right? He's not the player. So he, he put this added pressure on him, and he'd say, well, they have pressure no matter what because of my name. And that's true. But I think this is another level. I mean, that's going to be a major talking point all next fall. So they're at the league meetings. Um, the hip drop tackle was banned. Uh, the defensive players are objecting to it. It's very hard for a smaller player to tackle a big player. Um, puts the defense at a, a further disadvantage. I don't think the league cares. Um, also, yeah, no, yeah, it means more passes to the tight end. And my takeaway is they're going to throw the ball to the bigs more. Uh Replay assistance will now be permitted to change incorrect calls for roughing the passer and intentional grounding. Uh, people could argue, God, that's too much complexity to the replay system. I actually like that. Um, I, none of these, none of these bother me. I don't think, you know, one of the things that has changed in football and for the better, people often say they like defense. They like their team having a good defense. They don't really like defense. So if I said to you the Super Bowl was 9-6 to six or 28-27, fans would take the latter. People love defense when it's theirs. But people, fans will watch any great offense. It doesn't matter if it's the greatest show on turf. It's Mahomes and his biggest year with Tyreek. And so I think the league's very clearly saying, we're trying to keep the players healthy. We're going to lean offense. It's good for fantasy. It's good for TV. I, I mean, almost everything to me is just safety or TV product. That's how I view all these rule changes. Well, my initial reaction is I don't think it's necessary because I think the defensive player, you know, the the pure football element, if I'm trying to get, most guys are not Ray Lewis, Patrick Willis, and Brian Urlacher that just form tackle anybody in space. I'm doing whatever I can to get Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, or Travis Kelsey to the ground. Well, who did I just name? Beside the quarterbacks, the most famous players in the league have the ball in their hand. They want Debo Samuel, Alvin Kamara, Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley. They don't want them to get injured, right? Those are the people for fantasy football. People watch the casual fan, which the NFL has more of. They want to protect those guys. So I, I think it's just simple. Do they truly care about safety? I don't think they even did with the head. In. They just didn't want to get sued anymore. It was all a cover your ass move. And that's been regulated out of the game, right? There's no people don't launch themselves anymore. The quarterback, and you've been saying this forever. The quarterback's the most important position for all of us fans to watch. No one wants to watch the Bills play the Chiefs with two backup right. quarterbacks. Even if we get mad on 
ridiculous roughing the passers. The intention is to keep those guys safe. And that I understand that. This one, I'm not going to freak out until I see the way they call it because as a defender, the overwhelming majority of players are just trying to get the player right. to the ground. No one's trying. Even the guy that hurt Mark Andrews, obviously he was not trying to injure him. And I think this is where the players have been saying this forever. Once they cut the quote-unquote head hunting, they go after the knees. Well, what pays the bills for these guys? Their legs. And so we've seen a lot of knee injuries because guys get their knees blown out. It happened to the taller players like Gronk forever. So listen, I, I think they, they overreact to stuff like this. And uh, the writing was on the wall a couple of weeks ago when they were all openly talking about it in the league office. I would imagine a lot of coaches don't like it, but as we've seen, they don't give a shit what the coaches think. <laughs> you know? so this is all, like you said, it gets back to the TV. It's why whenever you see these rules, 90% of the time, the coaches would always vote. No, they have no power. Right. <laughs> it's just the league, the owners, and the money, which then the coaches and the players all benefit from. But some of these rules, back to, remember the CBA, there's no practice anymore. Well, yeah, that that limits the development of young quarterbacks and offensive linemen. But Roger Goodell and his team is not thinking about that. They're just thinking about revenue, growth, revenue, yeah. growth, and safety. And they, they've kind of figured yeah. out a formula and, and safety so, for the offensive players. You know, it, it, it's interesting. Um, I've always had kind of a theory about what I do uh, is that if I get new information, I change my opinion. And I'm not your classic journalist. Obviously, I'm not a boots on the ground guy, but I'm text. I'm texted NFL two NFL GMs today about something. So, and you have the same contact uh, contacts and the same kind of effort is that we're both seeking information constantly. And sometimes I just get new information. And I was very cool on Ryan Poles, um, you know, former offensive lineman, the Bears GM, a Velas Jones pick. I could not stand at number three. I just thought it was a complete whiff, and I thought they just didn't do their homework or their SEC scout didn't do their homework because at SC, he couldn't track the ball. He was a returner, Max. I didn't love the Chase Claypool move, but I understood it. Mooney was a smaller player. Chase was a big body, had a great rookie year. Distracted player didn't work. But I got to tell you, as a former offensive lineman, I think he's put some effort into draft capital, and I think their left tackle and right tackle can both play. They had another tackle. They moved inside. They've saved his career. I thought, the DJ Moore move, Keenan Allen, DeAndre Swift, Gerald Everett. I've got to be honest. I did not, a year ago, I did not trust Ryan Poles, the GM of the Bears. But I've got new information. The other thing they're doing, which the Steelers aren't, the Steelers and the Bears are defined defensively, their cultures. I mean, outside of Bradshaw and Ben and some talented receivers, it's a defensive culture. He is saying, no, no that's not what we're going to do here. We're going to spend money on offense. That's what the Rams do. What the Browns are doing. That's what the Chiefs are doing. It's the opposite of the Steelers. So I, well, I find over the last two weeks when he went and got Keenan, DeAndre Swift, good pass catching running back, 25-year-old kid, good player, not a great player, good player. And then Gerald Everett with Cole Komet. Those are functional, smart players. I've got to be honest, between Caleb, who I really like, between these offensive pieces, I I almost feel like I've got new information I think the I think the Bears got the GM right. How is he viewed inside the league? Well, I mean, I think he had what has potential to be one of the great moves in the history of the league in that trade that he made last year with the uh, Carolina Panthers, right? Because at, for a while, it looked like he was going to be defined on some of his worst moves that was early on. I mean, that Chase Claypool move was pretty embarrassing because his pick ended up being really high, and I think... Uh, the Steelers ended up drafting Joey Porter Jr., who's a really high end player. I mean, that pick at the high at the beginning of the second round is very, very valuable. Uh, but that Carolina Panther trade, I mean, truly was a game changer. And if Caleb, he does not have to become Patrick Mahomes. If he just is a top ten NFL quarterback, which would be probably the best quarterback in the history of the franchise, it would change their franchise forever. And he took advantage of a team and an owner who was desperate and cleaned up. Right. And he also added one of their best players who was under contract in DJ Moore. Because my first thought last year when they traded for Sweat, I'm like, God, that's a little much. Well, then they immediately got him. They started winning games. Their defense was better. So their draft pick actually <laughs> ended up not as bad. They got him under contract. And like, actually, that aged pretty well. I had to kind of eat that. I was like, well, that's not as crazy as it looked. So, yeah, you, you, when you work for Andy and Veach and John Dorsey, he was around a lot of high level people for a while. And I think it's fair. I'm sure you would agree, and you've done this, just like most people. Every human being makes bad business right. decisions. 
most people's are not public. As a GM, every move you make is very public, right? So you're going to have bad ones, but it doesn't have to define you if your great moves are awesome. Joe Douglas has had some really good moves for the Jets, but his quarterback moves so far have just not worked out, and it's going to ultimately get him fired if they right. don't work. So if you figure out the quarterback situation, which they are primed to do in Chicago, all these other kind of, they're not even ancillary moves because they were kind of big, have a chance to, if DJ Moore is just in the Pro Bowl for a couple of years and sweats a Pro Bowler, I mean, we're going to be talking about this guy like a top 10 GM. And if he can get the Bears as a winning operation. Now, as a GM, you're also very dependent on your head coach. There, there is no great general manager that doesn't either have a good to great right. head coach. So you, you you don't, once the season starts, you're not implementing anything. You're not well, with the player. You're not doing anything. Chris, really. So he's very... Chris Ballard's, rep- he's, it gets yeah, Chris Ballard's reputation is going to improve over the next two years because of Shane Steichen. Well, I mean, he has might have the next Kyle right. Shanahan, so it's gonna it's gonna change his life, right? It already did this year. The quarterback got hurt. We're all like, oh, the Colts are screwed. All of a sudden, they're in the playoff mix week seventeen yeah. with Gardner Minshew. So there's a lot of pressure on Eberflus, and, and look, most GMs get two coaches. So this was kind of a package deal. Polian, remember, was involved with the hiring he of was. these guys. Definitely Eberflus. So if this doesn't work out. You get another one. You got to get it right, because if he gets it right with Caleb and the players, he could be viewed as an elite guy. But if he doesn't, a lot like the quarterback position, just because you have a good quarterback, if your coach isn't good enough, you're going to be in trouble. I, I think the pressure on Eberflus, Sirianni and McCarthy, because of their markets, because I mean it's the Cowboys. He has no years left on his contract. They almost fired Sirianni like two months ago. Those guys are going to be in their own little stratosphere in the way we talk about it. But I think Eberflus, the, the pressure starts immediately because of their roster, because of the talent, and because they have a quarterback that we've been talking. It happened in Jacksonville, right? Part of Urban Meyer, obviously there was a lot going on, but like you got handed Trevor Lawrence. So the, to me, the pressure gets multiplied by like 10. You know that Frank Reich, all of a sudden we draft this guy at number one, we trade our franchise. I got to fire you. It's not worth I, I, that. That adds an element of pressure with the high quarterback pick, or it makes you D'Amico. Get the guy right. We're like, God, D'Amico's a shooting rocket ship. Now he might, he would have been probably saw, he would have figured it out because D'Amico's pretty special. But I, I don't know. I mean, Eberflus looks like he's changed his look. Feels a little you younger and hipper. <laughs> yeah. So uh, his team's good. I mean, there's no disputing the the roster talent is. I mean, Keenan Allen's a real. They have multiple receivers. They have a tight end. They got some good. They have picks. It's the other thing. It's not like they just get Caleb. Then they don't pick again until the second round. They have the ninth pick in the draft. So the ability to either trade back or take a player. Imagine if they get that right. So they have this really talented roster on paper already, and they had Caleb Williams and player X. If that guy becomes an immediate impact player, I mean, are we talking about this team as a wild well, card? I, I, if I was Chicago, I'd trade down at nine. I really would. It, again, you're in a, we've talked about the Chargers and the Giants. I think those positions like five and six are too rich for some of these quarterbacks nine you know if somebody wants to go Raiders 11 to nine that's different than 11 to Denver Denver sitting right there yeah too. so I can see uh where the Bears would move down just three spots because this draft I've been told has 18 first round players it's usually about 15 to 16 this feels like 18 or nine the UCLA end is kind of the end of perceived First round talent, you know, the end of the first round, those last eight, nine picks, it's no man's land. Everybody would rather have top of the second picks, but, but I've sure. heard the UCLA rush end is probably in that small group of last considered elite start day one players be very productive. So I, I do think the bears are in a good spot. I Jalen Johnson, the corner Montez sweat defensive line. I would think if, if they've got two receivers now, my take was their offensive moves in free agency signal that that number nine pick is going to go defense. They got to give Ibra something, right? You can't just keep saying, I got receivers, I got tight ends. And and for the record, I think they probably, they probably need, I mean, if you look at that position, there's a verse from Florida State, they could probably use another rush end. Yeah, you could take the Bama pass rusher as well. You could take one of those two guys for sure if you, if you get stuck. The one thing with Chicago, you'd say that division, Detroit kept their offensive coordinator, who I think a lot of people view as the linchpin of that operation. So they're, they're going to be good again. The talent on that roster is not really debatable. It's top five, six in the NFL, the, the Lions roster. And like most people, it's hard to bet against the Packers if Jordan Love's going to be a good player. So it's 
It's not like it's going to be easy for them, right? That that they are playing in, and if Minnesota is just a credible operation with a lot of good, talented players, it's going to be a challenge. And even if Caleb is really good, it's the NFL is hard. I mean, Peyton Manning set a record for interceptions his rookie year, so it's it's just the the pressure that comes along with it. Now, Caleb, like a, you know, a lot of guys in recent memory, has been under the spotlight. He's used to it. He's used to getting paid, so the money shouldn't overwhelm him. But there's When's the last time the Bears had this much pressure slash interest going into this? Well, it's probably 15 plus years ago. When's the ago. last time they had this much offensive talent? When's the last time the Bears had a legitimate star number one receiver and a legitimate star number two receiver? That's just not Been that, a while. you know, and, and a star quarterback. I, I couldn't tell you the last time he had Jay Cutler. Didn't he have Alshon Jeffrey? Yeah, he had Alshon. They had Brandon Marshall for that, a minute. They had those yep. two guys. I mean, they, they were solid. They, they they were they were a real team, and that's kind of what this. But Jay, by that time, was a veteran player. Played you know, Caleb's been in Lincoln Riley's offense. There is a little bit of a jolt. You know, yet Waldron runs more of the Shanahan operation. There's time to just get used to playing in a system where you're probably under center a little more. Now, part of it is as an offensive coordinator, you're not going to force him to do things he doesn't want to do. But you also have to kind of find a middle ground. So I, I'm fascinated. I, I like you said, R- Ryan Poles. I give him an A plus for about the last yep. twelve months. He's been kicking ass and no, taking names. I think he's done a really good job. And, I, and that's just one of the things I believe to be true. Like I never understood. Listen, you could criticize me all day long, but it's like I change my position all the time because I get new information. The other thing I think is funny about being in a public job, whether you're a quarterback or a mayor or a talk show host, things that look like a hot take end up not being a hot take. I mean, if I'd have told you a year before it happened, Kevin Durant's going to go to the Warriors. You'd be like, what are you talking about? Oklahoma City is a finals level team. And, you know, if you just said, you know, Sean Payton's going to take that Denver job. I mean, I, I remember when he took it, I was, he, he wouldn't talk to me the last couple of days when the rumor got out. And I'm like, eh, he wanted the Chargers job. He didn't want that Russell Wilson thing. That's not going to, there are so many, there are so many situations that I would have said 10 years ago, it's a hot take. Like I didn't get JJ McCarthy at all. And then all of a sudden I got two people from the combine. One said, yeah, we just talked to him at the whiteboard. She was unbelievable. And I was like, oh, that's what I heard about Baker before he went one. And then all of a sudden I saw 21 extra pounds show up. So the JJ McCarthy stuff is kind of one of these, if you'd have said it a year ago, there's going to be a wild pursuit of J.J. McCarthy to be a top five quarterback. A year ago, I would have been like, you're out of your mind. He's skinny. A year ago, I, I, I would have said watching the Penn State game, you know, <laughs> three, four months ago. Be like, you're nuts. Uh, the Ohio State, he played, he made some plays against Ohio State and Alabama, but throws. you never watched yeah. that. But, but here's the thing. When you draft a guy, you, you're not really just thinking about week one. Right, you're really thinking about 2027, 2028, 2030. You're thinking about him being your quarterback for a decade plus. He just turned 21 years old. For example, Will Levis is going to be 25, right? So it's like the the, the age matters. Uh, what he was asked to do matters. I, I saw John Lynch talk to the press today, and he's like, uh, he's like, you know, I wanted to go to the USC pro day, and he's like, one of my main scouts is like. Don't waste your time. Go to the Michigan Pro Day. They have 18 players. <laughs> we ain't taking Caleb. Go watch the talent. So he, he played on a team, Colin, that is going to set potentially the NFL record for players drafted in one individual draft. They already set the combine record. That They set six offensive yeah. linemen. Only five guys can play. I don't even know how that's possible. Right. But that shows you. It's like USC. Matt Castle's getting drafted. He's not even taking a snap. Shows you the talents at a different level. Well, when I out-talent most people... I don't need to be playing like Lincoln Riley and that, you know, try to score 45 points. That's not how Harbaugh's ever played. So I think you start, you know, judging him on the context of everything and character and all the intangible stuff. Let's face it. It doesn't matter as much as the other positions. Jalen Carter has a ton of red flags. He's a six foot five, 320 pound interior rusher. He was never falling out of the right. top 10. If a quarterback had those, I'm, I don't care how talented he is. He's not getting drafted. Yeah. I, He's just not. So wide receivers, defensive linemen, people are like, oh, yeah, we'll figure it out. So that quarterback Marvin Harrison Jr., I think benefits from his dad's very sort of quirky personality. His dad, you know, it's very well known. I've never even heard the guy talk, his dad or Marvin Harrison Jr. So it was very well under. I mean, I had a source tell me, I've had two sources once when he was playing and once recently talking about Marvin Harrison's dad. He didn't 
like after practice, sometimes he wouldn't shower in the facility. He would literally go home. Yeah. He didn't hang out with the players. So he was an oddball. Like, first of all, he only played on one side of the field with Peyton Manning. He was sort of a, kind of a rigid, oh, a rigid personality. There yeah. was a story about gun charges, Philadelphia, murder. I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> shit out there. So his son does goes to the combine. He won't talk. He won't do a pro day. He won't go to the combine. And my takeaway is, well, his dad, you can watch him play. He just doesn't look like anybody else. I love uh, Romo Dunze, but he doesn't have quite the explosiveness. Uh, the kid out of LSU is good. He doesn't quite have, um, you know, it, it, Harrison's just, he's like Calvin Johnson. I just don't see any holes. And the, the truth is, Ohio State does a good job with receivers, and his dad is probably giving him all sorts of insight. So it's funny about like people are getting caught up in hair, Marvin Harrison. And they're like, Oh, he doesn't talk. It's odd. I'm like, that's dad. That, I mean, people, Marvin Harrison, there's a 30 for 30 there. Like, no, I mean, it, totally. I, I know everything about Randy Moss. I know a lot about Calvin Johnson. Who's a pretty reticent guy. Doesn't talk. I don't know anything about Marvin Harrison. That's there's two great 30 for thirties that have never been done. Michael Jordan's wizard years, they were um that that won't get done either. <laughs> it was a sh you s show, and Michael won't let any of that stuff out. And the second one is Marvin Harrison in Indianapolis. I mean, he he was uh, I mean, it was he was on the team, but players would tell you he just wasn't one of the guys like at all. So that's his son. So I'm like I kind of chalk it up to like father like son. Yeah, well, one thing I saw with Mar or texting around you know i don't know if marvin harrison was going to run like four four five yeah. and if you run four five two you know when we're talking about the elite of the elite larry fitzgerald the julio jones julio jones ran like a four 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 with a broken foot remember at, at his pro day uh you know the calvin johnson's of the world he's not quite that and his dad's like none of this stuff matters just it doesn't matter so he's not doing any of it He's at any other position, or I mean, at the quarterback position, it would be weird. Like even Caleb threw at the pro day, right? Which I give him credit because when you work out at a pro day, who does it help? Brendan Rice. It helps your teammates. Marvin Harrison's in his own little world. No one cares if wide receivers are in their own little world. You watch wide receivers during contract negotiations in the NFL. It's always a, a big hoopla. It, it's just not like that at other positions. So. I, you know, you talk to people in the NFL, they don't all believe that Marvin might be the best prospect in this draft, the kid at LSU, but he's got some off-the-field questions. Rome is probably a little safer, bigger, but is he as fast? Is he as crisp? You know, it depends who you talk to. Where All these guys are getting drafted somewhere between 6 and 12. So, I mean, at the end of the day, that, that's the other thing that bothers me. Like, he fell in the draft. He went 7th or ninth. You know, it's not falling in the draft. Quarterbacks push guys down. Offensive linemen push guys down. If you get drafted at 11th overall, you're, you're pretty highly viewed in NFL circles, I think it's safe to say. So one of the things, uh, John Middlecoff, three and out, former NFL scout, one of the things um, people come up to me all the time when I uh, I mention my podcast or they ask me about the volume and they, you've got a lot of fans out there. And one of the things uh, that I think is a uh, strength is you're a very relatable guy. You like your vodka. You like your gambling. Uh, you know, you're just like a, a relatable guy. You like your golf. I want to talk about the Shohei Otani story because my takeaway, and I know it came off as sort of maybe callous, um, but as long as he didn't bet baseball, I don't care. Um, first of all, our life experiences shape us. My first job out of college was Vegas. I just knew gamblers. It didn't mean anything. I didn't think they were bad people. I mean, people are doing things on Wall Street with my 401k. I have much greater concerns that what they're doing in a sports book at the Hilton. Uh, the second thing is when you're young and you're making a lot of money, and like I'm not talking like a million dollars. I'm talking like Mahomes, Shohei Otani. You have people that are really doing a lot of your work for you. You're not doing your books. Um, you know, I mean, everybody in Hollywood, even even B actors, they have entertainment attorneys and accountants. Uh, the, Shohei Otani is not looking at his checking account like the the rest of us are. Like he has no idea. He may have multiple checking his accounts in Los Angeles to avoid taxes. You know, you've got LLCs. 
S corps, you're yeah. doing whatever you can. Now he's a, he's an employee. So there's limitations on what he can do, but you know, you're all trying to in California with 13 and a half percent, you know, state taxes to avoid it. This part, I totally believe he's not watching his checking account. Like that money is going to his attorneys. It's going to his stock portfolio. I heard when Tiger Woods was in his prime, he was sending a check of, and I'm not just like 20 million a month to his financial advisor. Like they just off the top, 20 million, $240 million. It was something something absurd like that. It it yeah. was he was making a hundred million dollars a year. Yeah, so no, he it was, was writing a fifteen million dollar check or ten million dollar check. It's maybe not it that was crazy. maybe it was twenty million dollars a year off the top, just went to the market. So it was some absurd yeah. amount. And you know, you're not you've got people that do this. I can buy Otani saying, listen, man, he's a friend. I have a checking account. I I gave him, you know, I, I it's like power of attorney. I allowed him to take some stuff out because I just I'm busy, and it goes sideways fast. That's a lot of money if you're drawing stuff out of a, Otani's account and it's seven million dollars. You're thinking I'm taking four grand. He doesn't have a clue, which he doesn't. I can buy that Otani didn't know and feels completely burned by a friend. I can buy that. Can you? Yeah, I actually played golf last week with a guy that owns a big insurance company in Boston, and he has actors and Major League Baseball players, basically their life insurance accounts. And he said he's never talked to one of them. He just was on the phone getting business with one of the, he wouldn't tell me the name. He's like, you know, rules, but one of the main actresses in Hollywood. And he talked to the person that runs all of her money. And all she has to do is say yes or no, and they'll do it. And then he runs the point. She's not checking her checking account every day, like you said, like me. Right. right? <laughs> so to me, I think there's twofold on this. One, the overreaction that gambling. I, I grew up around. My dad was a farmer and knew a lot of people that risked a lot in business, and that was their mentality. And they gambled a lot. I've been around a lot of gamblers my entire life. People have been gambling since the history of time. It's got to be one of the longest running professions in the world. People have been doing it well before any of this stuff existed. It goes back to the 19, early 1900s with sports, right? Think about some of the scandals. So this reaction of like, well, this is getting crazy. This is Michael Jordan. One of the things we he's known for is he's gamble all the time. So how it's this notion that guys don't think like that. Now, he denied it today. He claimed that he knew That's nothing right. about it. And, and I heard you say if he had done it, as long as he's not betting on his team to right. lose, which I understand, I don't even think it would be that big a deal if he was gambling. One, you're gambling on football or EPL soccer. Who cares? And two, it's very realistic. He just signed a $700 million contract where he was cool getting $20 million over the next 10 years. Does that not show you how rich the guy yeah. is? N name me another know, human beside like Warren Buffett that I mean, would agree people to People forget that. how much money like Kobe Bryant made in Turkey or Brad Pitt made overseas. Like American audiences have no idea. When you're George Clooney, you're Brad Pitt, Denzel Washington, you're, you're making $30 million a year, Leonardo DiCaprio, European commercial. Go to You go to Italy and Leonardo DiCaprio is like commercials in Italy. Kobe Bryant made a fortune in China, in Turkey. So like, can you imagine what Shohei Otani makes in Asia? Well, there, it's, it's, it's reported that it's $60 million this upcoming year. It easily could be way higher. I remember when Hideki Matsuyama won the Masters and Paul Azinger is like, he might be the next billion-dollar athlete. <laughs> Just Japanese golfer, <laughs> right? There, there's a small percentage. Remember Yao Ming? We talked about forever. The Asian market is huge. One, like they were very close. Clearly, they'd known each other for a while. Not crazy that he stole. I think it's crazier than a bookie. I'm fascinated by this bookie to be able to run lines at $4.5 million. Like how you have the ability to run a line of credit. Like even in Vegas, Right, a big money guy. I mean, a million dollar line of credit for a super rich guy with a company that's worth hundreds of millions—that's pretty big. So you, you're getting lines of credit. This guy must. I'm fascinated by this whole bookie when it all comes out. This operation probably pretty big, which probably hints why the feds were after right. this guy. Who maybe some Hollywood guys, but I, one, I, I just don't really care. And, and my, my first reaction is, I just want to see this guy play. Now, I, I, Ethan Strauss, our buddy, wrote an article. I, I couldn't disagree more. Like I what just think article? that this basically saying that gambling is like, I, I don't want to not ruining society, but just getting so aggressive and we're becoming numb to it. I'd say, well, what about alcohol? 
Listen, I mean, alcohol wanna, has been a it's been a driving force in society the history well, of time. Here, here's one of the things: whenever I see journalists, you know, and they can be, I think journalists. I've said this before. My top criticism: they have agendas. Acknowledge it. We all do. Um, and secondly, don't be naive. If you're going to be a journalist, then be a true journalist. Do you know the average bet with DraftKings is four dollars? It's hard to ruin your family if you're betting ten of those a day. All <laughs> right. It's $4. I used to work for another gambling company. They told me their average bet was four and a half dollars. That includes big bettors. The second thing, the disturbance or distortion rate among gamblers is 1% of which every time I read an ad, I have a 1-800 phone number I have to give out. The distortion or disturbance rate with alcohol is 6%. Should we close all the bars in Chicago? <laughs> like, and they don't read, they say, please drink responsibly. That's about the only warning you get. So my take on this work. I do both. It's not even arguable. Alcohol is way worse for you than yes. gambling. I don't care yeah. who you it's are. It's bad for your brain. <laughs> it's bad for your finances. Not You're debatable. bad for your liver. You know, and also when you look at gambling, look at the hold the state lottery has. Look at how much money people give to the state lottery and the small amount, the small amount the public a winner gets back. The hold in gambling, I bet 50 bucks in a game. And I don't, I mean, I, I make a good living. I bet 20 bucks on a two, three team parlay. The hold on a straight bet, 50% chance I get it back. Ethan also defended Otani in the sense that if he was gambling, it is complicated if, if you're foreign, you come to this country and wait, I can, I, I play in Arizona, it's legal. I come to California, it's illegal. I go to Texas, it's illegal, but then I go to Chicago. It's like, it is kind of complicated, right? So, and the leagues jumped head first into yeah. this. And I think for the players, the NFL found immediately that it was a complicated scenario and they got really aggressive with the punishment. Obviously, you can't cover, you know, gamble on sports. You're allowed to gamble on other sports. You just have to leave the facility. Yeah. But it's, they, they jumped so fast and then they expected everyone to follow the rules. But money's all relative. I mean, I, I heard, I, I played golf with a guy that caddied at the big country club in Arizona, and he says there are countless gambling games where putts can be two to three hundred thousand dollars by the 18th hole. So, Bunny, which to that guy, if he's worth five hundred million, is no different than if I'm worth a hundred thousand and I'm betting a hundred a thousand dollars a lot of money. Yeah, and so, money four point five million dollars sounds a lot of money to ninety nine point nine percent of people. To show Otani, let's face it, it is a tiny, tiny percentage of his yearly income let alone the guy's net well, worth, if he's even gambling, if you want to believe him. I, I I simply don't care. I just want to watch him play yeah. baseball. I mean, the greatest basketball player ever in many eyes is Michael Jordan, prodigious gambler. The best analyst in NBA history is Charles Barkley, noted gambler. Like, we think of football and gambling. The truth of the matter is basketball players, golfers, it's just part of our culture. And I think... I, I, if you look, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, John, when I'm out, I've been a public figure for a while, right? Maybe the 13th rung of a public figure in Los Angeles, but people know you, Colin. People so know. So when you. I go out, the overwhelming thing people say for six months of the year, hey, what's your blazing five this week? That's what I've been doing that for, hold on. I've been doing blazing five for 19 years. So this is not like DraftKings sponsors the show. I'm pro I've been doing this forever when I made nothing on it. Now I do. DraftKings helps support the volume and other ventures. But I think you have to understand Europe's been way ahead of us on this. And people may say, oh, there's just, there's ads everywhere. You don't have to watch the ads. There's also tire ads, mattress ads have dominated sports my entire life. Beer ads. There's, I mean, college athletics, there's like, like hard alcohol ads, like binge drinking alcohol. So I'm, I'm not just saying this because of my relationship, our relationship as a company with this. In the end, I think if Ethan Strauss did make that argument, and I'm sure he did, that it's confusing for Otani, I'm making the argument that when you make that kind of money, people are running your bank accounts. And I could absolutely, you say to yourself, Dave, $4 million. It's amazing if you just kept taking out 20 grand. 20 grand, 20. You start looking at that account. I bet you he doesn't even see that account at all. No. 100%. I also think that 
the overall discussion, I, I think about some people that I'm still friends with, either that I grew up with and then I, that I went to college with. One of our binding connections is gambling. And, and one thing a lot of journalists who and people in the media, I would say, that have the journalistic background that talk about this stuff, wouldn't you say a large percentage of them not only have never gambled, but will That's never right. gamble? It's not really, it's not their yeah. thing. It's not in their yeah. DNA. We're mo- you said I'm a normal guy. I just do what most people yeah. do. Like I, most of my friends in life, and I, I don't mean they gamble thousands of dollars, but they just bet on it. I get texts all the time during football season. Who do you like this weekend? Who do, you, who do you like tonight? I mean, that's just how people discuss. And we were discussing, we were talking like that well before DraftKings and these other companies ever that's came right. around. It's like I, I was the other night, Ann and I went to a Bulls game and I, I was laughing. I'm like, I said, you know, Ann and I got, we like to have a cocktail. And we'll have a couple of cocktails yeah, yeah. and watch the game and laugh. We're just having a ball together. And we went out later that night. And I said, are we the only people in this arena having fun? <laughs> like everybody else is watching the game. And I'm like, we got cocktails. We're having a good time. 30% of Americans don't drink. 50% of Americans don't bet. I mean, Jesus, half the men, I mean, 50%, uh, I think it's all the intimacy in America is by 50% of the men. There's a lot of people not gambling, not drinking, not sex. And it's like, thank God I'm on the other side of that. <laughs> thank yeah. God. It's not- Be a shitty life. I don't want to know anything about it. I'll promise you that. <laughs> I've seen your beautiful girlfriend. You're in great shape. All right. DraftKings did release its win total. So we both talked about the power of Kirk Cousins. Atlanta is a shocking 10 and a half over under. And the Vikings, who I think are stacked offensively, are at six and a half. That's Kirk Cousins. Let me throw another one at you. This one. So I, when the Jets last year had Aaron Rodgers, I said, listen, the history of old quarterbacks is they got to have good O-lines. Russell Wilson's first year in Denver, they didn't. He stunk. Stafford Rams did. Then his third year, I think it was, they didn't. He struggled. Brady's first year in Tampa, excellent. They had injuries. It wasn't as good. You can't have a 40-year-old. That's why Atlanta for Kirk Cousins works. That's a really good O-line. That's why Jared Goff works. He's younger, but great O-line. So the Jets have signed some kind of like Tyron Smith, who will play about 13 games a year, uh, kid from the Ravens. The Jets are nine and a half. And I'm like, time out. If you look at the AFC, Deshaun Watson's back. Um, you know, uh, uh, Herbert's got a legitimate coach. C.J. Stroud is moving up fast. Trevor Lawrence will be healthy. Um, you know, two of Mike McDaniels are going nowhere. Uh, Josh Allen now has between Kincaid and Cook has some really nice offensive weapons. I look at the Jets in nine and a half and I think, boy, you are. That's a bad old line for an old quarterback off an Achilles surgery. I said it this year during the season. Aaron being relevant in January to me is over. It's nothing against Aaron. It's just old quarterbacks and crappy old lines don't work. What do you make on that? I would bet the under on that all day. Well, I, I've been down on him, but if I wanted to make the case, Miami just lost a ton of yes. talent. They had a lot of guys walk out the door. They also lost Vic Fangio, and their defense was already in question, and Vic called them out thinking like no one wants to focus, and I think a lot has to do with the city they live in. Are they about to pay two of $45, $50 million a year? Because if they do, I'm out. And so to me, Miami still has some question marks, even if we all agree Mike is a great play caller. Quarterback, I'm definitely not sold on. And defensively, I mean, they just lost their best defensive player. He just walked in free agency. The Patriots, now the Jets finally beat him, I think, week, whatever, the last week of the season, have owned the Jets. Didn't didn't Bill beat him like eight straight seasons, swept them. Well, Bill's gone. I think the Patriots got a couple years of coming to Jesus yeah. and Robert Kraft is about to find out what the NFL is really yeah. like. It could be ugly yeah. there. And then the bills, like I, I, whenever I see the Super Bowl windows close, I laugh as long as you have Josh Allen, when you have Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, your roster can be in flux. You got a chance, but the jets did beat yeah. them in one game last yeah. year. So I'd have to look at the rest of their schedule. I eight to nine wins best. That, that's assuming Aaron Rodgers, who let's face it, you go back because part of Russell Wilson isn't just the last two years. Remember the last year in Seattle. So now it's, it's a body of work going the wrong way. Aaron, the, the last year in Green Bay, something was off. It might have just been age. In the history of sports, most guys at 38, 39 start trending the wrong way. I, I, I know he's a healthy guy. He looks good, but he wasn't quite as fast. His arm's still there, 
but a huge part of his ability was the well, ad lib, and that made John, him a great player. The analytics, Greg Cosell and Warren Sharp and others were on this. Aaron's analytics is he just didn't run anymore. Like, and if he doesn't run, I mean, say what you want to. Well, but he's not as fast probably anymore. So he doesn't want to risk getting tackled yeah, or hit. Yeah, guys don't want to get hit. I mean, you know, Eli Manning and Brady mastered it. Get rid of it quick or figure out how to roll and not get hit. So I don't think Aaron, I also think Aaron isn't quite as committed as a lot of the young guys that are really bigger, stronger. And I, and I think the only way to be good is sort of to be focused like Kirk Cousins later or obsessed like Brady. I don't think there's a way to be casually. And, and Aaron, you know, I've heard this from multiple people. Aaron, he's not going to sit and watch game film all weekend. That's not what he's going to do as a personality. He's going to read some things and listen to music and do his own thing. He is not Brady on the film. He's not Peyton. That's not, he's not Breeze as a workaholic. Aaron has is one of those guys it's almost like well, because he had more physical capability than those guys. It's like a rock star, you know the the Bonos and the bands edges that have survived didn't have long periods of drug use. Like they took care of their body, they yeah. partied, but they have aged very well. The bands that didn't haven't. Like I think Aaron didn't quite take the same level of care, and I think he's aging faster than other guys. Yeah, I think if he can't move anywhere remotely like he used to, that's a problem. The one thing he has going that Peyton lost, Breeze lost, Rob, their, their arms failed them. You know, Roger's arm is still strong, so to me, he's still going to be able to function. But I think his day, the day and age of him just being some lock elite player, it, it's been gone now for a couple years. And I just think the question now is the pressure on the offensive coordinator, which let's face it, if you just pulled people in the NFL, is Nate Hackett any good or is he not any good? Most people would say he's not any good. And then the other reason he's there is because he meshes with Aaron. So is Aaron just telling him what to do? Like there's got to be a little give and take. And you saw how many times this year with Aaron shaking his head, you know, with play calls when he would show up. It's just, I, I think it's got a chance to be a pattern. They do have some players. There's no disputing that. They have impact players on both sides of the ball. But if you can't protect a quarterback who now can't really move, Jared Goff, like you said, can't move. Well, he's got arguably the best offensive line in the league, doesn't need to move. Well, if these guys, if Smith gets hurt, if Moses gets hurt, if their interior offensive line isn't any good, you're sitting duck. Even Zach Wilson kept them alive last year because he just kind of scrambled around. And so, yeah, I I, I think the Jets are fascinating. I, that division, though, I think I think Miami could be in for uh come back to the uh, to the the average a little bit and the Patriots are in for real NFL life. Now <laughs> the other thing I saw the Cowboys like 10 and a half too. That, that seems a little high. I mean, they've lost a lot so, of players, by the way, Niners, Ravens, chiefs, 11 and a half. I tend to bet the unders once you get into that space, um, lions, Packers, Eagles, bills, Bengals, dolphins, Falcons, Cowboys, Falcons, the head scratcher a little bit, 10 and a half Texans, jets, nine and a half. I'd buy that with the Texans. I don't with the jets. Uh, Rams pull back to eight and a half. I think Aaron Donald, they subtract a win. I thought they would be nine and a half ish Vikings, very low Kirk cousins, not there. And uh, Patriots Panthers at four and a half Titans Broncos, five and a half. Again, it, it, I, I do believe with the Broncos, I, I think they're going to draft a quarter. I, and I think to be honest with you, Bo Nix would win immediately because I think he's got 61 starts. I just interviewed, I talked to the yeah. kid last week for 30 minutes, 35 minutes on and off the air. Mm -hmm. He's just a grown up. He's ready to play NFL football. Whether or not you think he has this high ceiling, he, that kid's seen it. You know, he's had five offensive coordinators in five years and he's worked with all of them. He's going to work. I think adversity has proven to matter a lot with a lot of these quarterbacks that have had some struggles in college. Like Mahomes wasn't winning a lot. Josh Allen was told, we don't have scholarships for you, right? Lamar Jackson tumbled in the draft. Bo Nix got his ass kicked in the SEC. Yeah. I mean, he was viewed even when he transferred to Oregon. So, yeah. I, I'm fascinated by him. I, I think he needs to go to the right spot. And, and Sean Payton, I mean, they're let's face it, they're kind of desperate right now. I guess they could just kind of roll it over a year, but I don't think Sean Payton's making $18 million a year to try to win four or five games. Like, he's going to try to compete immediately in that division. Now, with Harbaugh in it, it got a lot harder. Even the Raiders, I don't know if Pierce is going to be a great head coach. They do have impact yes. players. They're not like an easy team no, to play. No, they've, they're... I've said this for years. I, the Raiders have five or six, and they have key positions, star receiver, rush in, yeah. left tackle. Like, if they could get a quarterback right, I don't doubt the Raiders. Because shit, at the end of the year, I thought they were really competitive, playing with a lot of fire and purpose with Aiden O'Connell. So I'm okay with it. Um, I, I, by the way, I was in the car today, 
And I, I turned you on right as you were talking to Mick Cronin about his struggles. And he gave the line, I still turn left on sunset. That's one of the greatest lines I've ever heard. I don't think yeah, whether you win eight games or you win 30, I still turn left on sunset. That's, that's an all time yeah, over that hill from Encino. It's a left right by the circular hotel. And you go left on sunset into Bel Air, then Beverly Hills, then right to UCLA. It's pretty good life. I haven't been to every campus in America, but when you walk on UCLA's campus, there there's got to be a short list of campuses. Oh no, there's, I don't think there's anything like it. I mean, USC, Stanford, you know, there's it's LA, it's it's the Bay Area, but nope, there's nothing like UCLA I've ever been to. No, John Middlecoff, former NFL scout, his podcast is three and out. Chopped it up for a little over an hour this week. Loved uh, seeing you, buddy. We'll we'll talk in a week. Okay, see you, Colin.